Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. As we've talked about already, one of the things that we're looking to do is have conversations with as many as the of the UCP leadership candidates as we possibly can. Not only because it's going to be important for the future of that party, but whoever gets elected into the role will pretty much automatically become premier for about six months. And that has a big impact on the entire province, especially given the the tone that we've seen from the previous administration, let's call it. Um, we have already had one of those conversations. That's up and available. And we're very excited for this second conversation. We, we get to welcome back somebody to the show who's who's been on the show before. Uh, and, and she's not afraid of, of using some words. So we're a little excited about that. So we're very excited to welcome back to the show, MLA for Chestermere Strathmore. Oh, I got to make a note here because now I have a question after I ask right out of the gates. MLA for Chestermere Strathmore, Leela here. Leela, thank you so much for coming back and chatting with us today. Thanks for having me, Nate. It's really, really nice to see you. It's been a while. So I just realized as I was doing the introduction and I would be, I would kick myself if I didn't ask this. Honorable? So yes, evidently, um, well not evidently, you get to keep your honorable no matter whether you're in the ministry or not. So yes, that still um, is in my title. However, um, as you well know, I am I am a public servant, a very humble servant to the people. I'm Leela to you and everyone else. I had to ask because we had Stephanie McLean on when we were doing a bit on the NDP and she still has, or she started using the honor, honor, honorable, honorific uh, and it occurred to me as we were chatting, like, wait a second. Yeah, I, admit that, I suppose, which is lovely, but um, I'm Leela to you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So to start with, the last time we chatted, we were chatting because you were publicly calling for Mr. Kenny to step down from the leadership of the UCP for a whole list of reasons. Um, some of it was toxic environment within cabinet and caucus. Some of it was the mishandling of COVID. There's, there's, we could do a whole laundry list. I don't feel like we need to. I think people know. And Mr. Kenny did ultimately after, I guess, technically surviving a, uh, a leadership review. He has promised to step down eventually. Um, so in the wake of that, though, you've made an announcement that you're running for UCP leader how did that unfold? Well, <laughs> there is, I'm, I, I don't know, it, it makes me emotional actually to talk about it because, um, and you know a little bit about my history, but my, my dad came from India in 1963, married my mom in Edmonton, and my dad's a huge patriot, and he's, and my mom is a musician and they had, you know, and my dad is Southeast Asian from Andhra Pradesh. So he's quite black. He's this beautiful chocolate brown color. My mom is a little Caucasian redhead, Irish, English, Scottish, and Scandinavian. And in the in 1969 and 70, this was unusual, right? And so when I was born a year later in 1970, um, you're born into this automatic family that is unusual and loves the province so much and my dad always told me you know like he got off the airplane and this couple George and Panji Strange basically scooped up this group of uh, East Indian boys that were coming to study at the university here my dad was an engineer or is an engineer to this day and he was scooped up by this family they didn't have children of their own they embraced him they helped him, you know, get his first vehicle, medical car, you know, all that kind of stuff in this cold, cold province that they came to from India. And he just embraced um, the Edmontonian culture. He got part, he was part of a bridge club. He joined a choir, like a Western, you know, he comes from Southeast Asian music. He joined a, a classical choir, which is actually where he met my mom. But he's just instilled in me this, um, beautiful love of my province and our province and the Canadian culture as it were he was so embraced and loved when he came in he was a like I said a true patriot but also just gave me a very strong understanding of how lucky we were and so full circle to the conversation that we're having right now you just feel compelled to give back especially when you know, you've been, I've, I've been elected for seven years now and eight years by the end of my term. So two terms, you have a lot to give back and a lot to offer. We've made some great straight, you know, some great strides in policy and legislation, but we also made some really serious errors and mistakes. And sometimes 
you're in it long enough that you get a chance to fix your mistakes, which is beautiful. That's an amazing opportunity because you don't have to go based on what you thought the process was initially and you stick to it, you know, you dig in, you actually get to see how things are working because no policy, no legislation is perfect. There's always going to be tweaks and things that need to be made, but also the approach that you use in bringing forth that legislation can also cause concern and pain and frustration and all that. So the opportunity to what I suppose what compelled me even more so than my desire to give back to the province was the opportunity to be able to talk to just every Albertan, uh, not ideologically, Nate, but from a space of what do you really want? You know, where, how do you feel? Where are things going? How do we align our amazing oil and gas manufacturing sector with the, our environmental strengths that we have? How do we market that? How do we work collaboratively with whether we're in government or we're in opposition with, you know, that democracy that we're so privileged to participate in without you and every other Albertan fighting a ground war on behalf of the people who happen to be in the opposition or in the government, right? COVID really showed us that it was just so divisive and leadership on both sides really used the people of the province to elevate their own agendas. And that became really obvious, especially when you're in a rural area, there's so many diverse uh, thoughts and ideas. You're, you're de-escalating a lot of conversations, right? And then further to that, really finding finding out what is the expectation of our political leaders with the way that things have changed. And, and I mean, since you and I even chatted last time, the world has shifted so much. How do you, how do you incorporate that, be a, an excellent leader of any sort of, whether that's in your community, in your family, if you have the privilege of sitting where I am right now, and bring those folks together so that opposition is used for robust debate, in order to debate the issues, to bring forward better legislation or to justify the legislation you have, work with our federal counterparts. I mean, I have as many issues with the feds as anybody, but that is our federal government. And we have to figure out a way to carve out some time and some space to figure out how we bring Alberta into, into the light, right? And really shine lights on our capacity, what we're capable of here, our, 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 uh, our economic power, as far as you know, what we bring to the country, who we are as people, our cultural savvy that we have here that a lot of people don't know, the kind of heartbeat that we have. We have you know, a population of 325,000 Francophonie. We're actually, I don't know if you knew this, but um, right now as our population sits, 51% of the population is women, which is very powerful, but also 52% of, of our population is somewhere in the ethnic minority. So just to give you an idea of the dynamic that has even changed since probably we spoke last, the desire to come to Alberta is so strong and you need a government and a reflection of that and the safety nets that come along with that and the embracing of those cultures, the desire to develop the economy together so that that prosperity is something that we can all be super proud of, but so we can also fund the programs that are so needed in our province, right? There's just so many things and um, the war in Ukraine has really highlighted, I think for a lot of people, even in our hardest times, how blessed we are here. And it kind of shifted us away from our devastation and, and PTSD over COVID to seeing that, holy moly, like, look at what is happening in this century. There is a movement to try and take over a country at this time in the world. Not that it's not happening elsewhere, but what a, what a call to action for, you know, what you and I are responsible for. How, how, how what is our behavior going to leverage? There are so many things that could happen as a result of what is going on in Ukraine right now. Those are sensitivities that I think are very important and need to be reflected in how we treat people and how we speak to them. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm going to try to unpack some of it. But I think the thing that I want to start with is you talked about the relationship between the, the, the government and the opposition. And to say that the relationship that we've seen over the last three years, maybe even four or five, has been more fraught than I think that we've seen it in Alberta's history would probably be a fairly safe statement with the occasional historical outlier. But, I mean, we saw in the run-up to 2019, we saw promises from the, the UCP and Mr. Kenny to restore decorum. And then within a few weeks, we saw them handing out earplugs in the legislature. So I guess the, the first question that I want to ask you in regards to that is how would you restore that relationship between the, the government and the opposition, regardless of what side of the aisle the UCP ends up on? Uh, 
the one of the very first things is making sure that private members bills make it to the floor to be debated. I mean, Ralph Klein, was it in 1993? Please forgive me if I've got my dates wrong. Um, changed the standing orders in order to make sure that private members bills actually had some strength and that they weren't being put to the bottom of the order papers. And I, I apologize again if I don't have that 100% correct, but generally. Um, seeing um, uh, private members legislation being denied in the legislature, whether you like that legislation or not, is completely inappropriate. And um, there were even pieces of legislation on our side. I mean, you saw the one that came forward on conscience rights. There was a lot of things that I would have voted against my own, you know, party on legislation, and I did. But, you know, but I would have also been happy to have a robust debate with the NDP on their pieces of legislation that they brought forward. I actually spoke about this a fair amount in the legislature. And I think, too, like, if that's, I can speak for us from that side. But also on Rachel's side is during the COVID you know, when we're all just panicking and everything, using people's fear to elevate your own position versus actually standing with government and saying, okay, let's dig in, let's figure out here, let's take fear away from the people and let's find out what we're actually doing. Because a lot of other provinces did that, Nate. You didn't see a lot of opposing things happening. We were one of the few legislatures that actually ran throughout COVID. And so it gave the opposition a huge opportunity to participate. And I'm not saying that the questions that they were asking were wrong, but the rhetoric in which was used in order that the people on the ground were the ones that were hurt. The, us, the, oh, those of us who are sitting in the legislature, we have, we have access to a little bit more information than you do. We're, we're in a, you know, our, our, our relative bubbles of what we think is going on but you're the ones who get hurt. You're finding a ground war that is happening between two ideological groups that can't get their crap together in order to help people, right? That's, that's what I, that was a real game changer for me. And then when you do set rules and then you break them and don't apologize for breaking those rules. And again, that, that's how you've seen that happen on both sides here. Um, that's, that's the thing that happens is that that culture let's say something happens, there needs to be a space in an organization whereby you can, you can help fix that culture. You an opportunity to speak about it, to figure out what your, what your strategy is going to be, um, apologize, alter, change, um, you know, talk about those things. There is no, the, the legislature, it has no culture of that never has. And we actually need to change that, that respect. If that is happening in that building will it bleeds out to when you're with the people. And so that your language isn't always so abrasive or aggressive or, or whatever. I mean, I'm a very aggressive person when it comes to debate and when I wanna get things done, I, have, I don't have any um, concerns about saying that I'm confident in the way that I speak or anything like that. I have no problems debating the issues. But when it comes to the human interaction part of it, um, there, we have a responsibility to the people that we serve. And that requires humility. It requires being able to back down for a minute to be able to see if what you're actually doing and saying is helping the people, or are you being part? Are you part of the problem? And those are that's the entire premise of why I'm sitting in front of you today, to put in to ask Albertans for the permission to lead alongside of them, is because there is a humongous opportunity to build and not divide. There's a humongous opportunity of optimism and to not throw people um, aside for ideological reasons. There's a humongous opportunity to see the future and to plan ahead and to have the opposition be there in that democratic way to hold us accountable. And some of that might mean like when you're, when you're looking at more um, serious pieces of legislation that you bring opposition and oppositional people to the table to actually have a discussion about it. So, you know, you get lots of ideas from lots of different places. I, th I think that was a vote that we missed in COVID too. There was a lot of interesting ideas out there, but if, if there was a transparent discussion about it, let's say, right, and everybody's around the table and you pull the best information that you can along with the science of the doctors that are leading that discussion, you open up a lot more people's eyes that you're at least open to the discussion. Doesn't mean that you have to agree. Doesn't mean that you're, you know, pro, you know, I, as you know, I'm pro vaccine. I, I did my, um, I did my utmost in my community to share that as much as possible. But I'm also pro choice. So I want people to have choice over their bodies. It's imperative for me from women's uh, reproductive rights all the way to uh, mandates for vaccines. I, I don't, I don't speak out of both sides of my mouth with that. I'm, I'm pro choice on all things that way. So 
those are, and, and what I found is that having conversations in my riding where we had a lot of folks in the convoy, a lot of folks that were scared of vaccine, a lot of folks that were in that space, you know, if you sat and had a conversation with these people, um, you're not going to necessarily agree on, because obviously we're coming from a different perspective, but there was a mutual respect that was found there. And at least they trust you enough to know that they can have the conversation. Now, I, I want to jump into one thing that you said there, because the 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 piece around the vaccine mandates has been a highly controversial piece in Alberta. Um, well, I mean, really anywhere that they've Everywhere. been enacted. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that we saw in Alberta was when the province was trying to get people vaccinated, they really did try to go with the carrot approach first, where they were like, we'll give you free tickets to stampede. I still can't get through that without laughing. I apologize. Uh, as well as they, they offered the cash incentives and all of that. But it wasn't until the vaccine mandates were introduced that we saw triple the uptake in the vaccination rates. So, you know, the, I think that there's a, a fine line to be had in regards to, well, you, I don't think that anyone was forced to get vaccinated. That's my personal opinion. Um, I think that... I think that people had the choice. Yeah, it was language though, right? Uh, yeah. This is, yeah, 100%. We're on the same page there, yeah. Okay. So would you would you say that you supported the decision by the province to introduce the, what was it, uh, REP? The, so I think that at that point in time, the province was doing what the businesses were asking us to do. And I think that when that happens, you have to, that was a good consultation how it was, it's not the idea, Nate, it is the implementation. This is where we failed regularly, right? When you're doing an, an REP program, or for example, to go further down the line to a vaccine passport or whatever they were calling it, right? When you're going into that and the advice is being given early on, your responsibility then, especially because none of us really knew what was going on, like we were trying our best, like any other government, right? To try and figure out what the opportunities were there to help people to get vaccinated. You have to give people lead up and understanding and time and ability to adapt. And especially in, in places like restaurants and stuff where sometimes it was really hard to enforce, there has to be a general understanding. And then you also have, so that's one line, but then you have the other line, like you were saying, it's not like you were being forced to get vaccinated, although in some spaces there were, but then you have to have those protocols really well outlined for those who are not as well too, so that, that we know that masking and distance and all of these other things are hugely important in the spread. And if we're talking about what's important here, we're talking about, you know, keeping people out of the hospital and about, and about transmission. Of course, when all of this stuff was coming in, we're sort of in wave three, wave four, and we didn't know with Delta what was going on. By Omicron, we realized it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated, you're still a carrier, you're still transmissible. So there's a very different mentality with that than you would have with what we knew about the wave three and, and the Delta variant, right? So all of those things being equal, I think you do the best you can under the circumstances, but then, then following that you have a responsibility to reach out to people and be super humble and super compelling in the why does that make sense there are so many things that we can accomplish together that are really difficult decisions that you stick by but you sit you are implementing it in a way that makes sense it's not confusing you have open doors of communication and i'm like i'm saying it wasn't just us that that had these problems this is a global issue but then to continue the process of making those mistakes after the fact, that's where the problem came in, right? And so, again, I'm sitting in front of you in a very privileged position of knowing better now. So that's the past. We did what we did at that point in time. What now, right? And if, and if for example, if the opposition had worked collaboratively with the government to sit down and say, okay, how are we... How are we going about this? This is what we're hearing in Edmonton. This is what we're hearing here. That's what we're hearing in Grand Prairie. This is what we're hearing in Strathmore. You have to also be able to rely on your municipal governments who are also elected bodies to be able to work collaboratively with you so you have local solutions to local problems because the city of Edmonton is going to have a very, very different look and outcome than a smaller village that is outside. And those are very, that's a cultural sensitivity. 
not only to rural, but also to the families. Like if we look at what happened in Brooks, for example, you know, we have so many of these beautiful um, new families that are coming from all over the world. There's a very compelling reason to make sure that our information is being translated and, and, and put into good space for people to understand. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to stop all of those things from happening, but that your reasons of implementation come from a very good place, right? So I, I think that the intention has to it has to match the work and then the implementation has to be part of that humility of like saying look at i uh, we're in a we're in a schmozzle here this is really difficult um you know dr dina is giving this us this excellent information this is what we are following through our dr Berna you and we're very grateful for them and elevate elevate the conversation and stop pointing fingers and saying this group of people had a spreader event there because they didn't get vaccinated or, you know, um, there's a particular group of people that aren't vaccinated that are filling up our hospitals or whatever. All of those may be factual in some aspect or the other, but how you handle it and the way you communicate and the humility with which you enter into those conversations makes all the difference for your outcomes. It's interesting you say that because one of the things that we've heard here over and over and over again, uh, even from, you know, some of the the more well-known political analysts, we had Dwayne Brad on the show a while back and he was very clear almost. And it's fascinating having conversations with people because almost everybody puts a pin in the moment where they lost faith with uh, Aloha Gate. And th it all stems from the fact that there was uh, a perceived and real double standard that existed where the the government communication was please stay home yes it's christmas we know it sucks please stay home don't go nowhere and then we saw other people not doing that and that made people angry i mean i've i've argued for years that one cardinal sin in alberta in politics is if you if you start to behave like you think you're better than the electorate oh you're gonna have some problems um but moving on from there because we've got a lot of ground to cover um yeah. curriculum Yes. What do so, you want to know? <laughs> well, we're seeing uh, it's I, I don't know if you've heard. It's been a little problematic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was out of that conversation. Yeah, you're going to have to tell me. Sorry, I'm just joking. I shouldn't joke um, about the pretty. This is serious. Stuff. Well, it is serious, but I think we have to be able to still to use humor. Otherwise, we just are sad people. Um, so. The curriculum has been a highly contentious uh, issue, not only because of the way that in particular the social studies curriculum was developed and people still don't know what's going on with that, but also because coming out of COVID um, and teachers having a very short break during the summer. Uh, and I think that really, if there have ever been a couple of years where, where teachers really need a little bit of time to decompress, um, given the, the burgeoning class sizes and everything else that's going on. Um, I, I don't know that teachers should be spending their whole summer prepping for a curriculum that not everybody likes. What would you, what would your, if, if you get elected as UCP leader, what is your position on, on the curriculum? Do we keep it, the whole thing? Do we keep parts of it? Uh, do we, do we scrap it? Do we do we get rid of the the bad social studies curriculum? Please say yes. Yes, I'll say yes to that first. Absolutely, hundred percent. I'm in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yay for that. Okay. <laughs> Can I start backwards and work to the front of your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I'm gonna. The reason I would like to give some context is because um, what I'd like to see happen, and this will be part of um, what I'll be putting on a much more uh, solid statement, but just to give you some background of what I believe. Um, we, it wouldn't matter, it could be the most per perfect curriculum in the world. It was marketed or wrong, it was brought to the people wrong. Again, remember how we were just talking about humility, implementation, all of the things? it completely applies to this curriculum as well too. And so aside from the um, horrific errors and, and whatnot that was happening in the curriculum, uh, upon having the privilege of talking to um, the ATA, uh, teachers, and, and I'm talking teachers from all ideologies, all background, uh, everybody you can imagine, principals, um, parents, the um the kiddos as well too uh try and understand and then you brought up the point of of covid 
good Lord, no, Lord knows. I mean, it's just thrown everything, you know, by the wayside. The curriculum was an ambitious thing from the beginning and the NDP had already done some work and the entire notion that something had to be completely thrown out from the beginning started us off on the wrong foot. Does that make sense? Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not saying I, I'm I'm part of that problem, Nate. I, I I was part of that issue, but I also didn't particularly appreciate the way that the NDP had implemented theirs either. So I came from the Wild Rose side of things and and the UCP when I was the critic over there, and was having not not nearly this level of problems, but there was issues with that one as well too. Nobody's perfect; it's going to happen. So that's that's part of normal debate. I'm not. This isn't in any way to demean the um, the work that has been done on either side here. So upon talking to uh, multiple school boards and um, trustees and all, all the other, all the smart people, right? Um, there's, there's some really good stuff that has come out of this curriculum and, and that's good. So, so those pieces are good. Again, let's talk about implementation. Let's talk about resources and let's talk about timing. When you have an ambitious agenda like that and there's no evergreen, portion of it where you're doing sections or that you're you're having chances to sort of pilot a couple of different things it is very very difficult even when there's not a pandemic to uh to be able and i'm speaking out of uh from not being an experienced teacher so please forgive me this is not my journey but this is just based on my you know my consultations so did it need to be updated? 100%. Did there need to be? Updated? Absolutely. There's lots of things that still needed to be done. Um, and I think there's some really, really positive parts by and large. But we, are, our teachers are exhausted. Our parents are exhausted. The kids have finally had a graduation for the first time in two and a half years. Um, by and large, I believe that they just want more time and they need more resources. I think again, and the reason why I, I'm saying to you about the curriculum having good pieces isn't because I, that's not a me thing. I'm not a, I'm not a curriculum expert. This is coming from the people, right? And, um, and I think that because of, you know, the parents were used again as um, political footballs in all of this. So, you know, how are they supposed to know what's going on and especially in the midst of COVID-2 having to deal with kids at home having their own professional obligations all of that right so I think that um, I think that the controversy over the social studies really took flight and probably impacted the ability for any of the good parts of the curriculum to be marketed appropriately so why not just slow down pause bring everybody back around the table have a really honest discussion without any no pointing of fingers, no nothing, like what's working, what's not, and go back to the drawing board on the social studies and look at that. But it seems to me that there's a push for implementation, there's a push to get through. And I, I honestly, I don't think that's the right thing to do. And that's, again, I'm not an expert, so I'm not speaking from a place of expertise. I'm just place, speaking from a place of consultation. And quite frankly, anybody who's can even talk to the the people on your street or at the grocery store have the same impression. I mean, you don't have to go too far to come up with what I'm saying. What <laughs> does that make sense? I think it does. And I, I think you make a good point. Um, I mean, to be clear, the the social studies curriculum is an unmitigated dumpster fire that, that doesn't even get basic Alberta, Canada geography. Right. So uh, but there have been particularly the the English slash language arts is what I would call it because I'm old. I think it has a different name now. Um, but yeah. that, that component has received some positive feedback. So uh, one of the things that we've tried to do here is make sure that, you know, the, the very bad things are very, very bad. There's no question very, about very that. Very, very bad. Mm -hmm. um, but there is there is some merit to some of the things. And I think a lot of that has to do with who developed them and how they were developed. But what do I know? I'm just a podcaster. <laughs> Nate, to your point, like all of the curriculum and the politics aside, like just think about it for this, you know, we need to be real, build, re, uh, rebuild trust with teachers, right? We need to rebuild trust and get support of the ATA. 
Um, we need to make sure that we honor the parts of the curriculum that are doing well and that we get rid of the parts that are not doing. I, it sounds simple. Lord knows that that's the right thing to do. And um, there, believe me when I tell you, um, I am one of many people who have this opinion. I can't speak on behalf of anybody else, but I know that this is what's right for Albertans. And I have zero ego about it. I, I would much rather any day um, go back out because this, this is important enough to take your time right? Just cons consider that this isn't a legacy project. This isn't something that, I mean, do you want your legacy to be that you put in like the worst curriculum with no time implementation or resources and that your teachers are so tired that they can't even think straight. And this is the first summer they're able to spend with their families as well too, to, you know, rejuvenate and, and, and get back together and have time and travel potentially, whatever that is. And then also to plan new lesson plans based on new curriculums, in, in my opinion, that, um, that and, and it's interesting because you know they have, they're still doing the disruption funding, right? For, which makes sense. But then if you're still doing disruption funding and calling it disruption funding, doesn't that sort of contradict the idea of then re-implementing a new uh, curriculum right away that we're being told isn't resourced properly I don't have enough information to tell you whether that's correct or not. However, this would be a, an absolute priority going forward, right? That much I can say. But yeah. it's, well, it's, an, it's an interesting dichotomy like of what, what people are saying and what they're doing. And again, we fall into this issue of idea, bringing it forward, and holy crap, terrible implementation. Yeah, it's, the the legacy piece I think is important because you know, when you were when you were talking about you know who really wants to take credit, I can't think of many examples, if any, off the top of my head, where somebody's been standing in front of a raging dump fi dumpster fire and gone, "I did that uh, proudly." So, um, but I want to stick with education for two more points: class sizes and learning conditions. Um, this is something that a lot of teachers wanted to see included in the recent mediated contract with the uh, employer. Um, and the mediator said that the two sides were so far apart on it that they couldn't even include it in the mediated contract. Um, is that a priority for you? Would that be a priority with your, I mean, if you're elected and you become premier? Um, yeah. Is that something that you would try to address in those five, six months? Is that something that you would try to bring forward in a new platform? I mean, it's a big, big beast. It's not going to get solved in five, six months. I would but... be lucky. Yeah, I, would be, I wish I had a silver bullet for you on this because, as you know, in different areas, it's it's there are different and unique things. And if I may, um, classroom size is, I'm not saying it's not an issue, but just put that aside for a second. If you talk to any teacher, you want to know what the problem is. It's the complexity of the classroom. That's actually the major issue. Um, we all preach about inclusion. I have special needs child, so I'm speaking from a very, very honest place about this. We preach about inclusion and the necessity for that, but then you have to be able to have the right situation for all of those kids to be able to learn, right, together, inclusively, or also there is nothing wrong with having separate classrooms for kids to learn as well too, to, so that everybody's having the best education possible. And then you have spaces where everybody comes together and you have learning pods where you have kids that are excelling at things, helping out kids, you know, in peer groups and all these kinds of things that is good for community and building and hubs and, you know, mental health and all those kinds of things. I actually think the solution to the problem is, is really unique to various school boards and to those school authorities that, you know, in some situations, if you don't have a super complex classroom, the, par the teachers are fine with a few more kiddos in the classroom because they're able to be able to work together. But that's not the case. In many of the situations, the complexity of the classroom is you could have only 25 kiddos right in there. But if that is a really complex classroom where you have several kids that are, you know, English is not the first language and they're just learning. So there's super amounts of intelligence there, but reaching them is different. And then you have kids that are going through mental health and, and issues at home that, again, you know, are, are not having capacity. Like, the teachers are dealing with all of that. So yes and no. 
I think it's part of the problem, but I think it's another politicized issue. It is not an overnight thing. You have to be able to build that infrastructure, one. Number two, do you have the teachers to fill the spots? No, we don't. We could build as many classrooms as we want to, but you also have to have the teachers to teach in there. So that's those are two things that are very pragmatic and, and imp important parts of the solution, but those are that's a bit more long-term. If we're talking short-term right now, we actually have to look at the composition of the classrooms and find out how best we can support our teachers in those situations. So that um, whether that is um, more aids coming in or supports, natural supports in the school that help with the um, complexities in that classroom, um, whether that is making sure that the teachers are um, having times where they can pull back, you know, like, like their mental health is for, first and foremost in, in particular situations and making sure that there are spaces to be able to move kids around to as needed in order to be able to help the, the learning that happens in any particular classroom. It's, it, that would be, and, and again, I'm not the expert. I don't have all the answers. These are things that have been relayed to me by people way smarter than me. And I trust the teachers when they tell me that yeah, classroom size is an issue, but in all honesty, it's the complexity in the classrooms that have been probably the most challenging. And you have to understand um, our mental health, relative mental health is, is, is tough right now at the best of times. And our kids and teachers are right within that as well too. So I think if we took all of that into consideration and looked at like, maybe the funding needs to change, Nate, like maybe we're, maybe the allocations where they're going, how that's working needs to be looked at differently. And that's something that the government and the school authorities have to actually discuss together. Um, the, the deal that was struck the other day was a good deal. I'm grateful that it went through. That's awesome. Um, does it solve all the problems? No, it does not. However, I don't want to get caught into a discussion that becomes another political football that I can't actually solve for you. I would be lying. Um, if I said I could solve that or if I had a solution, um, talent is as important as spaces. We learned that during COVID. We had thousands of rooms or spaces available for beds if we needed to expand care, but we only had so many respiratory therapists, only so many ICU nurses, and only so many people with capacity to be able to deal with those that were in ICU. So it's the same sort of thing. I hope that makes sense. I think it does. I, I mean, I'm going to rephrase the question. Would it, would it be a something that would be a priority for your administration oh absolutely but you have to but again i'm just i'm just giving you an honest yeah, no no yeah, yeah. It, there's there's so many things like we're building a lot of schools right now right which is great um and we just have to make sure we got the teachers to be in there so i think you'll see capacity change like my my community of chestermere and strathmore fights for second and third fastest growing community in canada so we just actually i just was shoveling the dirt onto Prasad Panda today, Minister Panda, for a school that we've been working on for seven and a half years. So it was such a beautiful day. But if I, but Nate, I, you know, people give the government credit for that. We are, we are the, we're the stewards of your dollars. We don't get credit for building a school. That's your money. Our responsibility is to build that. You want to know who got that school done? The volunteers, the community, the lobbies. And guess what? The kids wrote me five or six hundred letters. That's what built that. This community built that school. Their taxpayer dollars built that school. Again, if you look at it with that lens and a different humility, and you can hear people differently, I think we can solve a lot of these problems. There's um, there's one school in Red Deer, and I'm sorry, I'm grasping for the name of it, but they've had an immense success because they have this um, a set of like six counselors slash psychologists that are available to all of the kids, right, in the school. And so what has happened is that it's reduced stigma around having the conversations. Everybody has access to these wonderful humans that have built this support network in that school. It has taken the pressure off of the teachers that are, you know, not knowing how to obviously be able to teach and cope with, you know, the action, you know, the, the, the acting out, right, of a kiddo that is having a hard time. And they've really taken the ball and been able to figure out that's a solution you can look at. That's not necessarily a bigger classroom, but it, it helps with the capacity. Right. So does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. Um, I would if I don't ask this question, I know that the, the, the comments and, and, and my God, the tweets will never end. So I have to ask it. GSAs. We saw the UCP roll back some changes uh, for the protections of GSAs, predominantly the piece that had to do with requiring a, a timeline for GSAs to be formed. 
Would you do anything with GSA legislation? Would you keep it the same? Would you make some changes? Oh, I'm happy to make changes. I think um, uh, Pam Krauss actually, I don't know, do you remember the article that she wrote in? Um, it was talking about the GSAs. One, the greatest thing that happened for me and all of that is that they're entrenched in legislation. There's nowhere else in the country that, that where, where that is. Um, I, know, I know that it's been posed as a rollback of rights. Um, I think, and that there is a balance between, it's not about parents knowing or not knowing these. Because quite frankly, where we missed the ball again on this was in it. It was in our, the way we spoke about it. There is Well, no, Mr. Kennedy lied. So let me go to, like, I would, this is, it's interesting that you bring that up. I, here's the thing is that no child can ever be outed in a GSA. That's the law. And when, when the comments were made that, well, if a kid is, has suicidal ideations or everything, we have to tell parents, yeah, you do, but you don't have to tell them that they're in a GSA, that that conflation was completely wrong and has nothing to do with the legislation, which is why all of a sudden kids and parents were scared. It actually, his comments contradicted the actual work that had gone into entrenching. Does that make sense? But if there is language that yeah, we, we've done a whole episode or two or three on it because there yeah. was so much misinformation and there was so, so much. much disinformation so and much. parents were were so scared uh, yeah. about stuff that just wasn't true. Um, there you go. Implementation. That's my point. You you have a you have um, ideology leading a discussion around society and this and the and the societal norms that we're trying to change and and fix and create a humanistic uh, not create a human you have to have human-centered legislation human-centered people the minute that it goes to an idea of that well you know if this is happening with this kid we have to tell well no no kidding like there's a duty to care that teachers already have that is entrenched in their jobs so that was never it should have never been conflated with the work of entrenching the legislation. And quite frankly, the legislation is strong. Can there be language changes or strengthening? Oh my word, so all over that, so happy to do that at any time. And quite frankly, like my issues with the NDP's bill wasn't about the GSAs when we were in opposition. It's because they had opened up the School Act in 50.1 and 50.1A and B, I think it was, that allowed anybody to come to into a GSA. In a backdoor situation like that with kids, there are predators just waiting to come in on all sides of that. It could be somebody from believing that, you know, you should do conversion therapy, could go into school and tell a GSA that kids, sh you know, shouldn't be gay to somebody who is actively uh, a predator seeking kids that are in vulnerable situations. You can't have situations where there's not somebody overseeing the well-being of our kiddos in, in the school situation. Does that make sense? So that was my, act that was my active concerns with their legislation my active concerns with our legislation with i think i've said this a thousand times is that our own government misrepresented the reality of what we were doing with those gsas and if there is like you know the the word immediate was taken out if we need to put the word immediately back in i'm all in happy to do it if that helps then let's do it this is a okay. simple change for me that um 80, 90% of Albertans would be absolutely content with a hundred percent. I think especially if it was communicated accurately, they'd, they'd probably be some better buy-in. Oh, preach, <laughs> preach. Yes. <laughs> and only one person speaking out about it. It doesn't make enough sense. It just makes me look like I'm validating the bad decisions, but in all honesty, um, this was, this was things that I was super proud of to try and entrench because in the sense that in Canada, there is no other province that has the legislation that where it is illegal not to allow a student to start a GSA. That was probably one of the most important things for me ever to see entrenched in legislation. And I did not jump in the fountain for that. Just so you know, we were kidding around with the people. We were, we were, we punked, we, we, we punked the new guys to go into the fountain. I, I know you probably saw the Twitter thing on that, but anyways, just saying. Oh, <laughs> I, I think though, I think, I mean, here's, here's my, my, we'll, we'll do the fountain thing. And then I have two other actual things that I want to <laughs> okay. get through. Um, but I think that, that, the, the big reaction from the, the fountain thing was because 
Mr. Kenny and other members of the UCP had misrepresented the GSA piece so big and they had made it such a emotional hotspot for people on both sides of the, I can't even call it a debate because so much of it was lies, the, the furor, I guess. Um, I think that there were a lot of people who saw that picture and went, really though? If I may, Nate, no. Yeah, absolutely. They saw that picture and then it was used to go, really, no. If the picture had been put forward like, oh, we just punked a whole bunch of new MLAs telling them that they had to jump in the fountain at the at their end of their first session, it would have been a different story. However, somebody used that in that because there was obviously pain and fear. And they saw a bunch of us jumping into the fountain at the end of the session where they feel like a piece of legislation that passed was inappropriate. That's a fair conflation to make, but it was the wrong one. But it was used then to put forward. And on our side, we did nothing to, re we did nothing to resolve it. So it's, it's a three-part thing. There's, there was literally, and Speaker Cooper will stand up for this every day. He's like, go tell everybody to jump in the fountain, right? So I was the first one in the fountain in my dress going, come on, get in the Also, I've always really wanted to go in that fountain. It was just a really stupid excuse to like jump in. But what we were seeing as this like hilarious moment, which is all it was, believe me, and I've said this on multiple things, it doesn't take away from the pain that other people feel. But the fact that that picture was then picked up and used by a group of people who also have skin in the game in order to perpetuate their side of the story is also inappropriate. So all I'm saying is that it was just a bad, it's a bad combination of things that happened at the right time, but we didn't do anything to, um, to fix or alter the, the, the communication at that time. So we're equally, we're equally culpable in all that. I, I, I think the big takeaway for me now is, wow, there's a lot of very gullible MLAs. <laughs> there's a lot of gullible MLAs, but that's because we jumped in ourselves, right? If we hadn't jumped in. And I'm going to go in the fountain again once I fix that legislation and say, okay, new fountain picture, better day. There we go. And I think that that photo will probably be much better received. Um, the, the two big things that I want to hit, make sure I hit on before I go, and because I, don't, I know that you're busy and your time is valuable and I don't want to diminish any of that, but I got to ask about these two things. Um, I'm going to go with the lighter of the two. Oh, boy. First, yeah been such a light conversation <laughs> it has been you know very very surface um are are you are you pro bigfoot anti bigfoot which oh keep my the warm room to lose it good lord i lost my mind over that i the the, the <laughs> one of the many kerfluffles along the way and i use kerfluffles a big word for me i don't would swear. You keep the war room kerfluffle mm -hmm. would you keep the war room no of course not but having said that, there's more to it than that. It's actually quite complex. I actually don't know. I'm being completely honest. I don't know enough about its institution and where it sits and what would be required. Um, having said that, though, no, there's no. Um, the I, OK, so the idea of it and I think the piloting of it was a great idea for Alberta had it been implemented. <laughs> oh, boy, look at the theme <laughs> implemented appropriately. And the implementation was just such a failure on so many levels. Consistently. But, and yeah, consistently. I mean, can we talk about logos and all sorts of stuff like that? It actually, that kind of stuff keeps me up at night. You're just like, you wake up in the middle and I go, oh, no, not again. You know, it's just one of those things. Um, do I believe that there is a necessity to be able to promote and elevate and manage our incredible resources that we have in this province aligned with our environmental ability, 100%. Um, but quite frankly, Nate, if I've learned one thing through all of this, um, dividing people, destroying, pulling down, all of this does not, um, does not a province make. Our province needs to be built on our strength and our resilience and the things that we should be proud of. We should be so proud of our oil and gas sector. But you know what I'm even more proud of is that every oil and gas person that I've spoken to in probably the last month and a half, this was before I was even running, you, want, you know what they care about? They care about the view of their sector and the environmental and social governance and what they're leaving for their children. They care about the fact that their sector um, made the pipes and the tubes that kept people alive during COVID. They care about the, the fact that 
oil and gas right now as a commodity in Canada, given the horrific things that are going on in Ukraine, that a light is being shone on our sector and what a beautiful job we do. And also along with that, the divestment of not divestment, but the, the the ability to divest into other types of energy, because we know that that combination of energy, including nuclear and hydrogen at some point in time are going to be part of that mix. Our sector knows better. And if our sector is not out there fighting those fights, then we have to reconsider what is our purpose then in government to do that? Do we elevate and do we um, produce because we're producers in this province, make sure that government gets out of the way for that to do that, but we have the best regulatory processes in the world. Do we make sure that our people that are doing all of this work here are also exported to teach that technology to other countries? Uh, do we look at how it is that our oil and gas contribute to our schools, roads, and all of that? These are beautiful. The other thing I would put to you, um, in India, for example, which is my father's country of origin, you know, you have hundreds of millions of people in abject poverty. They deserve energy the same way we do. The, 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 the privilege that you and I have sitting here having this conversation, flicking on a light, having a toilet, not having to go out in the middle of the field in the middle of the night to protect your little girl from whatever is running around out there. Um, education, uh, micro loans, small businesses, the burgeoning middle class that is coming out of these third world countries. We have a global responsibility to make sure that our products get there. You see where I'm going with this. There's so much positive, affirming, um, a appropriate discussions that don't even make it to the front line of the discussions because there's just so much rhetoric and anger on both sides, you know? And if I could ever sit down and have a conversation with our prime minister, I would run him through what Canada means to the world globally in what we provide and what we produce and our global responsibility to making sure that people have access to cheap energy because it is all about education and elevating communities and, 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 and people around the world to be their best selves. And then we'll, we'll attract all of those wonderful, smart people to our province, hopefully, to come and work here because we have a teeny tiny population and we need lots more people to come here. So I think there's a symbiotic relationship between all of those things and there is such a beautiful and thoughtful way that we can talk about this that has nothing to do with rhetoric. And I would hope that I can bring that to the table. Okay. So I'm going to, again, rephrase my question. Um, if, if not get rid of the war room, would you defund it from taxpayer funding? Oh yeah. Like there's, there's no, yes. And again, I don't know how the corporation is set up. So I don't like, I'm I, capable. I, I know that. Yeah, so we have some work to do, right? And and somebody like me has to actually get in there to be able to make that happen, right? Okay. So, but my promise is to you is that we're gonna blow it open and see what it's what's going on in there and make sure that uh, that we fix that because, um, like I said to you, I think I've given you about a thousand other reasons of what we what is possible, and if there's ever a time in the future where something like that is necessary. I, hopefully we've learned from this pilot project what not to do and that we can do better things in the future. The only thing you can hope from Nate is that you learn from your mistakes, fix them, try to come back better. If you, if you have the privilege like me to, if I get elected for a third time, let alone become the leader of the party, there's so much that we can do together. And, and if we work on it collaboratively, you and I, where we sit on different, the, where we sit in, in the uh, political spectrum is irrelevant then. You're making good policy for the sake of good policy, not because you have an ideological bent. Oh, you teed me up for the next one. Um, and this, this, this will hopefully be my, my last. Ah, uh, you've said that before. I know, I'm bad at it. Um, yeah. Speaking of making good policy, one of your, your co-runners, whose, whose name maybe runs with Danielle Smith, uh, has put forward the Alberta Sovereignty Act idea, which has been largely panned by constitutional scholars and lawyers, uh, either for saying it's so not within any legal frameworks that it would never be able to be a thing, it would be immediately challenged, all the way to some people are referring to it as sedition and treason because it would be effectively ignoring the, the social contract, the, the rule of law that exists in, in our country, there have been some other candidates who have said, I like that idea. <laughs> um, 
Where do you stand on the Alberta Sovereignty Act? Where do you stand on on saying we're going to make our own laws and disregard what other orders of government have to say? I'm a rule follower, so I love the rule of law. It makes sense to me. Am I always like if, if I look at the Emergencies Act that Trudeau put in, was I disappointed with his decision on that in particular? Sure, um, we can we can debate the, the merits or the lack of merits in that all day long. And everybody has different opinion and that's fair. Going backwards from that, let me say this. The people of Alberta want collaboration. They're done with division and anger. They are done with being frustrated. Do we feel that we get taken advantage of? 100%. Is there a way for it? I think that the Fair Deal panel brought forward some excellent ideas, but we haven't parsed out yet whether or not we should have the RCMP or a provincial government. We haven't done enough research and background on that to see and being able to present to you, well, what's it gonna cost and how's that gonna look? And one, gov one, one policing force over another one does not necessarily make a better policing force. You, you can still have the same issues. Like look at the, the, um, the issues of, of um, bigotry and homophobia and misogyny that are already in so many of these organizations that need to fix those situations. We have a lot of work to do in policy, even, especially even at our level, right? When it comes to harassment or what harassment looks like or creating situations whereby you're able to fix those things internally. So, sorry, it's a long-winded conversation, but that's just one piece on the policing, for example. Then you look at collecting our own taxes. This is a phenomenal idea. I think there's great opportunity in that. Again, not parsed out enough. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, we have a lot of smart people that I think that can work on that to see if that's feasible and if that's in Alberta's best interest. Um, what, I, what I think concerns me most about that isn't the fact that she, Al, Danielle loves Alberta and she's a really dear friend of mine. I love her a lot. So this isn't, but what I wanna see from my leader whoever that ends up being, is a person who's magnanimous, who reads Albertans, who understands where our heartbeats are, who brings us together, who's not, again, starting another ground war for people to be fighting this versus this. We've never had the discussion. I mean, I live in a space where a separation comes up all of the time, but that's not the majority of the people of Alberta. I work also, I'm privileged, privileged to work with so many new Canadians, right? Lots and lots of, of the ethnic minorities in our province do you know these folks left everything behind, Nate? Family, friends, uh, gardens, communities, jobs that they loved, um, everything to start a new life here, to raise their children in a different, they didn't, they chose Alberta and they chose Canada. There is a deep rooted necessity for us to be able to help them participate in confederation in a way that is, is thoughtful, that includes, includes reconciliation, that talks to all of the things that Canadians care about these days. I'm, I'm a very proud Albertan and a proud Canadian. So it's important for me to try to try to work within that. Does that mean I'm not going to, I'm going to push back. There'll be pushback if we can't get what we need and, and, and a respect and an understanding for what Alberta needs. That's absolutely necessary. But I'd really, really love the opportunity to find out what, what, is, what is the barrier? What is it really? Can we just sit down and talk about what the problem is? Is it language? Is it that you just, you know, we just don't like each other? Is it um, that you, you need it to look a certain way in order for that pipeline to be built into Energy East because we need that pipeline? Or to make sure that we have tankers that are taking our products from, should we be privileged enough to build Keystone one day or what's happening with Trans Mountain? There are conversations and, and there are things I said, like I said, I'm frustrated with Trudeau with respect to the pipeline, anti-pipeline legislation and anti-tech legislation. I don't think that those are appropriate at all. However, why not, why not sit down and find out why? Has anybody ever asked why? No. So if we continue to use the population as our political footballs to forward our own agendas, I, I think that you end up again consi with consistent governments that are there for agendas that don't, don't actually include you and me. And that's just a critique of the policy. Um, I think that there are things in there that would be useful in terms of um, Alberta's strength and who we are. I think that kind of language is very important, but I'm mostly, in, I'm interested in building, not destroying. Th that comes to a, a bigger point. And I think that this is probably one of the fundamental questions of the, the leadership race. There seems to be two schools of thought that exist in regards to how the, the UCP 
And certainly for the next few months, potentially after 2023, I'm not making any predictions yet because the whole thing's a mess. Um, but there seems to be two schools of thought that are, are driving people's approaches to that in the leadership race and in the legislature. One of those schools of thought seems to be the, the weaponized populism where we're going to feed people a bunch of stuff that gets them really, really angry. And the other one seems to be more what you seem to be advocating for, that the, the compassionate servant leadership humility style thing. Um, how would you, as UCP leader, bridge those two? Oh, well, people who are in that, because, because honestly, the NDP has their populist side as well, too. This is a problem. Oh, sure with, they do. Yeah, it's a problem with ideological politics, right? But then you use the talents of those people who are the populace to work in files where that is useful. There are definitely times um, that I think that are pro-Alberta, the work that we're doing here. You know, um, one of the things um, when I was talking with my campaign manager, Sarah Biggs, we were talking about who's I know a great a friend of yours. We, sh we were talking about, you know, making sure that we have like like Calgary or sorry, Alberta ambassadors you know, in different parts of the, of the country that are really, really pro-Alberta and helping to build and leverage the strengths of Alberta and then backwards as well too, you know, to make sure that you have, you're leveraging the strengths of the other provinces. That's about building. So may, you know, those people who are those populous people, they're great at getting people energized and riled up, but why not do it in the right way? I think a really great leader doesn't lead because they're in front. They stand beside and they find the talents of those people. Because you probably have people in your world, too, that get their really good pot stirs. And the whole purpose of that person, right? You wouldn't be one of those, would you? Uh, yeah, but that the really good thing about that is that it puts us all into a space where we have to think about, okay, what am I doing here? What's my why, Right. Why am I doing this? That is always a good thing. It's always a good thing to be questioned. And it's always a good thing to be a challenge. Folks that are in that really heavy duty thought process are going to constantly challenge somebody like me. I want to be challenged that way. I want to be able, I've spent the last two and a half years of my life in my writing de-escalating all sorts of situations. Did we all always agree on things? No, I, I have dear, dear friends that are about as far away from me in terms of, you know, vaccine and all these other things as could be, but I love them and I'm going to protect their rights as much as I'm going to protect mine. But once one person's rights goes over the other line of the other person's rights, that's when we've crossed a barrier. And that's when true leadership has to step in. The populism has to disappear and you have to come up with some sort of way to maneuver and navigate a difficult situation which is not going to make everybody happy but you stick to your guns you stay consistent in your messaging you do it from a place of empathy you apologize when you get things wrong and you promise to try and get better and you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you so that you're working together collaboratively to build the province that we all know and love and i keep hearing about how you know take out we're going to get alberta back or we're going to you know bring back the Alberta advantage. Alberta's never had a disadvantage. This province will be fine despite whatever government is there. We are resilient, strong, amazing human beings. It doesn't matter. But the government that is there, we have a responsibility to elevate that process. We have to answer to the people. Our, uh, Alberta will never again elect arrogance, top-down, egocentric, ideological governments it will not happen ever again break. no it won't because even if one if, if if there's something that gets in there the people of alberta have been through too much they're not going to sit quietly and that's a beautiful thing the engagement level that COVID has brought out of all of these folks who i get asked the most insane questions by people in not insane but like you know in a grocery store right or at walmart or at my little, the little small businesses here, you just can't even get your nails done with getting into a, you know, a really, really cool conversation. But the, the people who, whether that's our First Nations, which, you know, we spend a lot of time with out where I live and a lot of the, the, the things that I'm talking about with you, Nate, has been really inspired by my own culture and First Nations culture, because that uh, idea of collaboration and, and you can't always build full consensus, but getting to that point is really, that process is really important. And it doesn't take as long as you think it does. 
It just requires a transparent and an honest discussion. What if you brought all of the people around the table to have a discussion about COVID from every set, from people who believe in, in um, you know, uh, you know, different kinds of treatments to, you know, people that were, you know, rubbing their skins down, or I think people were actually drinking like ethyl alcohol, right? Like there was yeah. all sorts of stuff that was going on. All of the things, right? What if everybody was at a table and we as politicians and regular everyday, severely normal Albertans sat and listened to that. And then you take it to the experts and go, okay, can you, can you like make sense of this for me? And then you come back, but you've been listened to. It doesn't matter. And I'll say this one last thing. Um, when all of the convoy stuff was happening and the blockades at Coots and what happened in Ottawa and what's continuing to happen in Ottawa, do you know what I needed to see? I needed to see our leadership on both sides come out and talk to people. They didn't have to agree. And I know that it was scary because people, it was, there was a lot of things that were going on. But our prime minister and our premier both needed to show humility and have a meeting with those people, sit in a room with them somewhere, have them move their trucks away from the places that were impacting the lives of people and have a conversation. And you can say to them, I can't, I can't believe you're doing this. I think what you're doing is wrong. I don't agree. All of those things. It's a very fair discussion to have. But these are leaders of our country and leaders of our province. You don't always get to talk to your, your bubble, to your, 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 you know, your yes people. Your responsibility is actually to talk to your no people and to, and to try and get them to understand and, and to lead with compassion, at least to hear the argument. You don't have to agree with it. And, and maybe, you know, the fear was is that people would say, oh my gosh, they're meeting with these people. Well, yeah, these are all Burtons and we're trying to get them off the road so Coots Border can open. Like it's a reasonable request, but we didn't have the capacity to message that too appropriately. And so, and neither did the Trudeau government. And so therefore there was a lost opportunity there, in my opinion, to lead with compassion and to lead with, um, to lead with in a different way that I think all of us need at this point in time. You have been so generous with your time and I have taken up so very much of it. Uh, so I just want to say uh, a big thank you for taking the time to sit down uh, and answer some some questions, some of which I, I know may not have been the most comfortable. Um, but I really do. I really do appreciate it. Um, and. I would argue, and the reason why we're trying to get as many candidates to the table as we can, it is this level of transparency, especially from a UCP government, that Albertans need to see now more than ever, given the damage that has regrettably been done in some ways. Nate, you, you, everything you said is correct. It's our responsibility now to earn back the trust of Albertans. We have a magnificent opportunity to do that. So your difficult questions are worthy. And, and I'm sorry I didn't have all the answers for you. I, there's no, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that. And I'd be lying to you if I told you something else. But the one thing I can promise you is that I'll work on all of it and that I'm willing to work with people and that um, I don't get offended. So if there's something that I'm doing wrong or that I need to fix, language that needs to be changed, I'm all in. If it makes it better for Albertans, I have zero ideological bent that could cause me trouble or may not. But if I was, I have to tell you the truth in what I'm trying to accomplish here. And if Alberta is ready for that, if Alberta is ready for a competency that goes beyond academia and goes into um, a competency in emotion and understanding and relationship building, then we might be ready for each other, right? And that's, that's something that I'm really looking forward to. Awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time today. My pleasure. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here at The Breakdown, we would love it if you swung by our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab and signed up for a small monthly sponsorship of the work that we're trying to do here. It is because of the support that we receive from our Patreon sponsors that we're able to continually up our game and it is tremendously appreciated. So I want to throw a big thank you out to them and you can go ahead and visit that website and join and support us as well because we need all the help we can get. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of these important conversations. And we will see you next time on The Breakdown.